Welcome to Sore Mag's Writer's Cafe, where we share the real writer's life over a cup of friendship, sprinkled with laughter and wisdom. My name is LaShonda Hoffman, and I'm your host. This episode is sponsored by Virtual Tea with LaShonda Promotion Strategy Session. Sitting at the cafe today is Tracy Lydia Gardner, Reese Ryan, and Anissa Short. Welcome, ladies. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Each of the authors will share who they are and tell us a little bit about their current book. We will start with Tracy. Tracy, please introduce yourself and tell us about your book. Well, good evening. I want to say thanks uh, for having me and thanks to everyone who is listening and listening to the replay. My name is Tracy Lydia Garner. I've been writing for almost 20 years, a very long time, and I've written 13 books. My heart is in romantic suspense, lots of scandal and car chases and baby mama drama and all kinds of twists and turns that I have enjoyed writing through all of these years. Um, I live in Virginia. I'm a Virginia native, and I entered writing through a contest that I won several years ago and got a book deal and a trip to New York and was just a life-changing event that helped me find my voice and gave me a sense of purpose, and I've been in love with it ever since. I will read an excerpt, and it's going to be really short. It says it's about Dean and China. Um, A Current Affair is currently available now and is out. It is the second book in the Jameson Family Series, the series about a Northern Virginia, D.C. area family that's well-to-do, but on the road to happiness keeps finding lots of roadblocks that meant to harm and hurt their family. And it is a four-book series with number three coming out later this year. And everybody's waiting for JoJo, which is the last and final book in the, in the series. But Dean, Dean lowered his hand. Where are your safety goggles, he asked China. Isn't the dust making your eyes water? She shrugged. I wear my glasses. You're lying. Anyway, even if you did wear your glasses, they're not the same. Debris falls, lands on your lashes, and gets into your eyes. It can scratch your retinas, Dean chided. And you should use gloves. You, should, you could get calluses on your hands, and that could hurt after a while. China looked down to the floor but nodded. She knew he was right. She needed goggles, gloves, a tool belt, a draw cloth if she planned to save the rug, and a host of other things if she was going to do this job right. He was always right. He hated it. Thanks, he said, and crossed her arms, preparing for whatever other notes of caution he had. I'm serious, China. I said thanks. Is this how it's going to be with us? How what is going to be? Man, I don't know, Dean exploded. This attitude, this silent treatment, you're sulking around when you said you were coming back after talking with Gary. You didn't come back and tell me anything at all. Why did you lie about your divorce? Then at my father's funeral, rather than have a conversation, you just ran. You act like I did something to you. I didn't do anything. I was waiting for you, and you never showed. And that was the excerpt from A Current Affair, Dean's Story, and it's available right now. Tracy, can you tell us what inspired this series for you? Well, this series is actually a continuation of a series that I started when I first started writing. I never finished the series, and I decided that I was going to finish it, and I just love the characters. What inspired it is that I don't have siblings. Um, I do have one sibling. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have one sibling, but I don't have a sister and, you know, another brother. I have one brother, and it's just the two of us, and so... All of these characters are four siblings, um, and I just love the bonds that people have. I don't understand sometimes so many children that people have, especially a long time ago. I was like, like, wow, there's a lot of people in here. But um, I also know that their bond (laughs) and their love is so wonderful. And so I just think about that, even though 
my brat part of me comes out like I'm not sharing nothing with nobody. So, but I know that true loving siblings share wonderful things, and so um, I wanted to explore them. And also, four books is probably my limit. My last series was three books, and it was about five brothers. But I only really visited with three main brothers. Uh, the Parker brothers, and so, um, but I also showed snippets of the other two's lives, so you do know what happens to them, but just something about the bond, the family, and love, and a little faith, and a little hope. Okay, I thought that was strange when you said you didn't have any siblings. I'm like, I thought she had a brother. <laughs> I know, I just hope shared my brother's, <laughs> me and my brother's picture on sibling day, so forgive me. Uh-huh. I met, I don't have any Sisters. Sisters, yeah. That's interesting. I don't have brothers. I have all sisters. So that's mm-hmm. uh, it's interesting. My, I married a man who has nine brothers and no sisters. Wow. So I got all my brothers with my in-law. So. And, and my mom was one of seven, and my dad, I think he was one of 13. And I was like, oh, my God, how does all these people? But, you know, you just, you don't know. You don't grow up with that. So it's a different experience. It, it definitely and I try to explore that. Yeah. Ms. Reese, are you ready? I am indeed. <laughs> Hi, I am Reese Ryan, and I write sexy, emotional romance with Captivating family drama, surprising secrets, and a posse of complex, flawed characters. I love my cast of uh, characters, family members, friends, and all that. And I love um, the whole family drama and stuff uh, that Tracy was talking about, too. So <laughs> I was all excited when she was talking about that. So, um, so I write that. And I currently live in North Carolina. I'm originally from Ohio. I live there the majority of my life. Um, but I've been here for about 10 years in North Carolina. And usually I do write, um, my stories are usually set in, in southern um, places. So um, including my two major series or whatever that I usually write, that I write are, are always in small, usually in small towns in North Carolina or some southern place. The other one's Tennessee, so, which is where my mother's family is originally from. So. Um, and I don't know if do you want me to go straight into the uh, book and excerpt or? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, so the book that I am uh, talking about today is my March release, which is part of the long-running Texas Cowman's uh, Club series that Desires has done. I think it's been around for like 20 years. So like twice a year they have many series. And it's, it's multi-author miniseries. And so this book is part of the Texas Kettleman Club Inheritance miniseries. And so there will be like, um, you know, four, six to nine books usually. And there's an overarching thing, but then there's all the individual stories in them. And so um, my book, Secret Air Seduction, is um, one of the books in the Texas Kettleman Club Inheritance series, and it's about a fashion mogul who discovers his true fraternity and newfound siblings, including a matchmaking sister determined to reunite him with his ex, a diamond heiress he split with five years ago. So, um, <laughs> so the excerpt that I'm going to read is after um, my character, who is this secret heir. Um, who finds out who his real father is after the man's died and his, his will has been read. And he discovers that he has these siblings or what have you. And so he goes to a diner in town and he's um, prepared to, he's just kind of having like a, a comfort meal. Um, and so in walks his ex. And so um, where I'm going to pick up, they've already, you know, done exchange their greetings or whatever. And she's sat down while she's, waiting for her order, um, and they had a little chat. She produced a gum-filled lollipop from her pocket, opened the wrapper, and popped it in her mouth. Was that a friggin' tongue ring? Darius was pretty sure his jaw hit the ground and another part of his body reached for the sky. Good thing he returned to his seat. Audra propped her elbows on the table and tilted her head as she studied him. What brings you to Royal? 
a business opportunity. It wasn't a lie. The opportunity to collaborate with Miranda had brought him to town. She sucked on that damn lollipop, which had already stained her tongue red and awaited further explanation. It's too early to share details. He picked up his burger. But I'm hoping to create a clothing line for a major fitness brand. Uh, When she said it, he couldn't help staring at her candy red pierced tongue. Miranda Dupree, scoring the clothing line for her goddess brand would be a major coup. How'd you... It's a small world, I guess, she shrugged. Miranda is my client's ex Stepmother, my client is Sophie Blackwood. Do you know her? His half-sister. Damn, it was a small world. Never met her, he shrugged, but I've heard the name. Less than an hour ago, in fact. Audra's mouth made a popping sound when she yanked the lollipop from between her lips. She stared at him, her brown eyes narrowed, judging him, as if she didn't believe him. Darius bit a mouthful of the bacon cheeseburger. He hadn't seen Audra in five years. They weren't together, and she had no right to know his personal business. So why did he feel as guilty now for telling her a half-truth as he had when they were together? Audra returned the sucker to her mouth and rose from the table. She didn't believe him, but she obviously didn't deem pursuing the truth worth her time. Knowing she found him unworthy made his chest ache. Her wordless condemnation was exactly what he deserved. Looks like they're done with my order, Audra nodded toward where Amanda was packing her to-go bag. Nice seeing you again, Darius. Good luck with fashion week. Darius groaned quietly as he swiped another French fry into his milkshake and took a bite. Audra made a hasty escape and couldn't blame her. He was a liar. Apparently, it was hereditary. So that is an excerpt of uh, Secret Air Seduction, which is already available. It came out in, in March. So you said this is part of a series. Um, did you have to pitch the story, or did they give you a story to write? So Texas Cattlemen Club is what is called the Continuity Series. And so usually how that works is the publisher develops, you know, the kind kind of develops the idea for the overarching series as well as the general idea for the story. So the first time I was approached about doing one of those, I was like, I can't write somebody else's story. You know, that's what in my head. It's like, okay, this is somebody else's story. But basically they give you, okay, like these five things or whatever need to happen in the course course of the story, and they give you general information about who the characters are. But then you have a lot of room to make it your individual story. So what I learned is that basically if, uh, you know, you give the same information to five different authors, you're going to get five very different stories, even though these basic elements are going to happen in each of the stories. So, So we don't pitch them. Usually they are... They pick. They offer the people um, in their line um, to participate in the Texas Colony Club. So it's kind of something that all, you know most people want to do, <laughs> and they invite you know a handful of people to do it every year. So that 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 works. I am part of another series where another author came up with the idea for the three of us to create our own continuity so to speak. So we developed it. So instead of them deciding, you know, these things are going to happen, we created the story, you know, from start to finish and pitched it to them. And so that's a, that's a series that I'm going to be part of next year. I like that. I, I wonder how that worked because I've seen those type of series before and I just wondered if mm. you pitched it or they just gave you like a, a synopsis of what they wanted and you just had to write into that. Interesting. Right. Miss mm-hmm. Anissa, you ready? Yes, I am. Great evening, everybody. And LaShonda, let me say first, thank you so very much for this opportunity. This is wonderful. I'm excited about it. And ladies, I am, um, appreciate the opportunity to share this flat platform with you this evening. 
My name, again, is Anissa Short. I am living currently in the state of North Carolina, originally from the state of Tennessee, was raised most of my childhood, born and raised in the Memphis, Tennessee area. So I'm a native of the South, no matter how you look at it. I'm a Southern Belle, as they say. Um, I am relatively new to the literary world from the perspective of being an author. The book that I'm going to share this evening is my second book, so I'm real, real new. I mean, very, very new. Um, but I like to describe myself as someone who has an appreciation for the literary world. I'm a, I have been an avid reader all of my life. Um, to describe myself, I'm married, of course. Um, I'm a person who, it, who believes her superpower is joy because I love to bring joy to atmospheres. I love joyous atmospheres and joyous environments. I'm a teacher and an encourager by, by my gifting is teacher and encourager. And um, I just love life. I love everything that brings that's all about positivity and excellence, not perfection, but excellence. And um, I love people. I love being around people. I love interacting with people. So I'm an extrovert from that perspective, but I also have a great appreciation for my quiet time left alone in my bedroom away from everybody. So I guess I got to help you balance the both. But um, tonight I'm going to read an excerpt from my second book, which is entitled The Vendor Blueprint. It is a home-based entrepreneur's guide to represent in, in the marketplace. Much of what I have written, which has only been two books so far, but I do have a third in the work, centers around um, entrepreneurship. Specifically, my target market is women. I'm a very much, very much um, an advocate of home-based entrepreneurship, regardless of the genre, regardless of the, ve- of, of, I should say the vehicle that a person chooses. I want to see people succeed. And I'm particularly um, motivated to see women succeed. So from this book, which is my second, it's called The Vendor Blueprint, and I will read um, for you the preface and introduction, which is just two short pages. And it reads, in 1999, I began my entrepreneurial journey, and within it, I have learned great life lessons. One of the biggest is how the principles of success apply not only to business, but every aspect of a person's life as well. I've come to better understand that perfection is a fantasy. However, excellence is one of the greatest projectors of success. Excellence is an attitude. It is a standard by which one chooses, and when used in the marketplace with intention, excellence is a magnet for success. Within the home-based business industry, for which I have had the pleasure of building a business, I have met many good-intentioned people with aspirations of becoming successful in business. Despite their desired success, however, many were not equipped with tools they needed to succeed. It is because of this revelation that this book was written. For those who have no knowledge of where to start in marketing their businesses or services, this book serves as a blueprint. For those who aspire to assist others, Within their sphere of influence, this book serves as a resource. For those with years of experience in successfully marketing or making your mark in the world of free enterprise, I hope this book serves to remind you that success is not accidental. Success is intentional and will be found where the spirit of excellence resides. Now that you've made the decision to begin your home-based business or made plans to take your business to another level, It's time to share yourself with the world. Are you ready? Are you fully prepared to move ahead? Could you use a little reassurance that what you've been doing is productive or maybe a little direction on how to improve upon things? After more than 30 years of working in various customer service and sales-related industries, what I know to be sure is this. Number one, you have seconds to make a first impression. Number two, what the eye sees, is what the eye will buy. And number three, three, as an entrepreneur, you are a business. Brand yourself accordingly. With these three points as my focus, this booklet was written as a guide to the business owner who has had no previous sales, marketing, or retailing experience. It will provide you with the tips, tools, resources, information, and a little professional advice necessary to achieve success as you build your brand. In addition to assisting the novice, This booklet will serve the seasoned entrepreneur as well. May the content within the pages support you as you continue to build and mentor others to do the same.
And that's it, ladies. Thank you. That was really good. I, I think I'm going to have to download that. As, um, <laughs> is this for, as you call it, the vendor blueprint? Is this for the vendor blueprint? Does it, have, does it have anything to do with vending? It does. Right. It has everything to do with vending. A lot okay. of times we have um, people who have home-based businesses tend to do the conferences and mm-hmm. the things that are hosted at the local chamber, and they have their table displays and things of that nature set up. I've done mm-hmm. a lot of that, and um, even prior to building my own business when I worked in government, I represented the agency that I worked for and set up displays and things of that nature. So I brought a lot of what I've learned in um, my business background as, and coupled it with the do's and the don'ts that I learned as a result of building my own home-based business. And over time, what happened actually is people began to reach out to me for advice on how to set up and what to do next, and I have no clue as to what to do. And someone gave me your name and number. And, um, and then I ended up, on the flip side, I would have people reach out to me who were hosting events, and they would ask that I assist or partner with them in collaborating and be in charge of the vendor aspect of the event. So it is from all of that that this book came about. Oh, I definitely will be sharing that because that's that's part of marketing that I do not have a clue about. I'm, I'm an online marketing girl, so vending is very new to me, and I'm always trying to learn new things about it. Um, Tracy is one who shares a lot about vending. She's good at vending, too. So I would definitely be looking for that. All right, so ladies, let's talk about this quarantine. How are you dealing with the quarantine? I'm sorry. Well, I'm personally loving it. I love it. I mean, I know people are struggling. You know, I don't want to, you know, mitigate any, um, you know, real struggles out there. And it's, it's very sad. And I actually work with um, disabled and vulnerable populations. And I am also disabled, but I have, you know, great family and support system, but I really and truly enjoyed myself because, you know, as a person with a disability, getting up and going out is hard. And I do feel a little sluggish only because, you know, I don't have to pump myself up, but I'm just counting it all joy and and trying to be grateful. And I've actually um, learned a lot of new things and had time to pursue, especially on the book side things that I didn't have time for. So I personally am just grateful and have really enjoyed this time off so much so that I'm thinking about, like, can I even go back to work? <laughs> like, may it's time to, like, you know, retire or something. So that's what I think every day I dread going back, you know, full throttle just because this time has been really a peaceful time and a productive time for me. I feel you. I, I sh- yeah, I share the same sentiment, really. <laughs> well, this is Anissa, and I enjoy, I've enjoyed it thus far. Um, I share the same sentiment. With, with, it's, it's kind of like a break without a break, a vacation without a vacation, and I don't mean to, to take away from what other people might be dealing with. Fortunately, we are blessed. Nothing has stopped for us other than my husband working at home, and that hasn't really been awkward for me because he's done that in the past. But I, I just told my husband myself, I said, you know, this is almost like a respite because we have become, mm-hmm. um, as a society, so busy, on the go, doing everything for everybody and just being, you know, go, 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 go. This was really almost like a way of everything coming to a, a stop and and giving us opportunity to kind of reassess some things. You know, I said, when we get back to normal, if we get back to what we have become accustomed to as normal, there are just some things I might even let go of just because mm-hmm. I was just too too busy, just entirely too busy to get just just too busy. I'm just gonna say that just too busy. It's, it's a good. T- it's been a good time to reprioritize some things. That's how I'm looking at it. I like how you guys are looking at it the positive way. I think the me I've dealt with three furloughs. So I was kind of prepared for um, this. When I was furloughed, I didn't work at all. So I was just at home on the couch looking crazy. This working from home <laughs> has been an experience. But um, as, as Tracy was talking about retirement, I times time to my husband. He keeps looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> Y'all, you're going to retire. <laughs> but uh, it has taught me um, that we have taken life for granted. 
you know, um, for me, I have looked at, I had to look at everything that was on my plate and what I was doing and what I wasn't doing. And then it, was, it showed me that uh, you get so busy that you don't even have time for your own family. You know, uh, we, right. my family, the only time we see each other was funerals. And so I set up a, a meet and greet on a Friday, and they were like, well, you know what, we're going to do it again Friday. And I'm like, well, I got other plans. I'm saying to myself, I got other plans. <laughs> but my sister's like, you started this, you got to be there. And I was like, okay. You know, but they wanted to they wanted to hang out on Friday. So we get on Zoom at 7 o'clock and talk and have a good time. You know, but I think that if this hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't have seen them to the next next funeral. You know, that's mm. just how people's lives are. And it's not because you're, you, you are you're just busy. You have all kinds of stuff. The best thing about for me is that I've gotten to spend time with my husband because he works nights. And so we usually see each other going in and out the door. I might see him for 10 minutes right. before he go to work or for 10 minutes before he go to bed. You know, so mm-hmm. we actually got the chance to sit, you know, people were like, oh, I can't stand my family. <laughs> and I have, not, I have not uttered those words because I've, you know, got a chance to hang out with my family, especially my husband. We've been married 20-some years, and we probably get to spend, this is probably the longest we've spent time together since we've been married. So it's been kind of nice. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I think that you have to look at this and see the positive side because if you just wallow in all the, the negativity, it, it will be a very hard experience. And I think that's what's going on with a lot of people is that they're only seeing the negative side of, oh, I ain't got money. Uh, and I tell my husband, we have a roof over our heads and we have food to eat. We don't need nothing else. We're fine, you know. And a lot of people, you know, well, I can't go shopping. And, what you need to go shopping for? You ain't going to work. <laughs> 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 Let's yeah. get it a way. How, how are you dealing with this? So I'm um, I'm I'm absolutely a an introvert and be a homebody anyway. Okay. So you know that's kind of just heaven for me being in the house and not having a reason to go. One of the things my husband often will say is, "Hey, why don't you ride to X Y Z with me so I can get you out of the house?" And I always look at him like. Who told you I wanted to leave the house? <laughs> you know, so, because I'm quite happy at home. <laughs> so, you know, but the biggest thing for me is, you know, so like I said, I've always worked from home. And so I still had the same crazy schedule and deadlines and stuff that I always had in terms of, you know, all the different writing projects I had going on. But on top of that, I um, now help with my grandkids. So I don't have them every day, but one day it might be, one week it might be one day. The next week it might be three days in a week. And so, you know, that really has thrown my schedule off. And then with my husband working at home, we have plenty of office spaces in our house. <laughs> but it's just like, you know, sometimes he'll be on a call or whatever. So, you know, it, it's different for me because I'm like, I, I went from being at home by myself every day to now, like, the kids don't go to school and just, I'm like, so... <laughs> I'm like, I feel like all these people are here all the time, <laughs> which I love them to death, but I'm also like, yeah, go away. <laughs> so, but, but I think for me the biggest um, problem that I did deal with is someone like what you were saying about the negativity and the stress of not knowing, and, you know, I'm a super empathetic person, so it's really hard for me to, like, hear about all the numbers, hear about people who are affected, see people who are losing their lives and stuff. And to also know that people are having very different experiences with this quarantine because, you know, like us, you know, we're fortunate that it has not impacted us in any way financially. But for a lot of people, it has changed everything for them, you know, Mm -hmm. and even just things like seeing the food line and how many people need help. So, like, all of that, like I said, I'm a super empathetic person, and all of that is, like, really draining for me. And so for a, for a while I was having a hard time, like, getting, being creative and being able to write and stuff, and I was, like, super stressed. And so I think I've finally come to the point where I'm, like, trying to find that balance between staying informed and not being overwhelmed you know, with everything that's, that's going on. But um, definitely all the good things about, you know, the quarantine, I've been loving that, you know, just being able to spend more time with family, being able to just enjoy our backyards and do things together, you know, with, you know, play cards or 
whatever with my husband at the house, that kind of thing. That has been nice to be able to spend more, to be able to spend more time reading. All of that. So, <laughs> but I, I definitely believe that things will never be 100% the same again because I think the companies mm-hmm. will look and see how effective it is to have workers at home. And so there's going to be a lot of change in how work goes forward. But one of the other things I've been remarking on is that the environment, um, I can't remember if it was Anissa who was saying about, you know, or how would this like a respite, it's been a respite for us, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it's been for the, the planet too, because like with Venice, they were saying you know, the water was you know filthy and smelled bad or whatever. And with everybody being home and not traveling, you know the water has you know cleared up. And some of the places that have a lot of smog on Earth, you know you could see the sky again, that kind of thing. So it's been good, I think, not just for people to have that break, but a lot of the resources of the planet, I think, have taken a little. Uh, been thankful for that break too. So <laughs> hopefully you know, some of those good like changes the, um, continue. It's almost like when when um, they built the art <laughs> and, and flooded everything out and everything came back fresh and new. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's almost like that. You know, we're we're getting. Sh- I, I say we're on a timeout right now. Everybody's on timeout, mm-hmm. and when it's time to go back. You'd be going back, but I think that our our normal will never be the norm anymore. Or I just think that it's going to change a lot. But even with my right. job, we were a lot of people were already working from home because we had a big move, and they made everybody work from home for like three months. And a lot of them was like, "I'm not coming back." <laughs> and they, right. You know, now it's like okay. And I was I was telling my husband, I said, I actually enjoy working from home. You know, you have mm-hmm. once you get your schedule together, it, it, it's fine. Right. You know, and like you, I have I I I have a big problem with not taking on everybody else's pain. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have a hard mm-hmm. time with that. But mm-hmm. um, so I was very uncreative for the first month. I was my mind was just completely fried. But I guess once I got my schedule and figured out things, then I could calm down enough to say, you know, life still goes on, and we're gonna. We're going to, you know, take it day by day and see what happens. Yeah. All mm-hmm. right, ladies, we are going to go to our break, um, and then we'll come back and talk a little more. So this episode sponsor is Virtual Tea with LaShonda Promotion Strategy Sessions. Are you frustrated by your promotion? It's time for a virtual tea session with LaShonda. Inside this session, you will discuss your promotion struggles and how to start a promotion plan. You will receive tips on how to be consistent with your promotion, how to find readers, how to use social media in your promotion plan, and tools to improve your promotion so you can become the social butterfly you're meant to be. Check the show notes for the link so you can schedule your virtual team promotion session with LaShonda and get on track to being a social butterfly. Welcome back to Sormex Writers Cafe. Today I am chatting with Tracy Lydia Gardner, Reese Ryan, Anita Short, and we are having a good discussion. And this question is all about what you're writing. So I want to know what draws you to the genre you're writing now. Let's start, Tracy. What draws me to the genre I'm writing now? I've always loved love stories. I mean, if you want to be depressed and sad, all you have to do is turn on the news post COVID 19. Uh, after COVID-19, before COVID-19, it, the news is just a sad thing. But I actually am a news junkie, and a lot of my stories come from the news. So I always think about people, you know, there was one snippet of their life. They did something crazy, silly, dumb, whatever, to get themselves on the news. And I take that, you know, whatever happened to them, use that as part of the story, but also build the front um, end of the story and then the end part of the story and kind of build it. And also, I only recently realized later in my life that some of what I write is, um, I always knew writing is cathartic, and yes, I'm dealing with different things, but it's more that I have to satisfy the curiosity in myself because I'm kind of obsessed with missing persons reports. 
Um, here we had Relisha Rudd, who was still missing and not accounted for, a little African-American girl in the D.C. area. I was obsessed with Natalie Holloway, um, and I watched that story for years, just hoping to find her and, of course, all how that unfolded and just different people that go missing. And I've used some of those stories just to um, my creation of what really happened just as a way to soothe um, the, the angst and the uncertainty that I have. I realize these are real people's lives, but I would get so obsessed with the story that I was like, where is this person? Find them. And just not, the not knowing just pained me. And I can only think about what the mother goes through or for their child and all of these things. And so, you know, um, some of the storytelling and some of why I love what I do is that things end happily, for one. And it's just a way to process, you know, the events of the day. And so that's really what I think about when I'm writing. And I, and I get to have my ending, however that is. It's not real. It's imagined. But it is a soothing thing to, to my soul, at least, and hopefully to others who can't make sense sometimes of complex uh, stories, you know, real life terrible things that happen. I like that. I like how you turn it to a story. I like that. Reese, you have anything to say? Yeah, for me, so the, what I write is romance that always has um, some injection of, uh, injection of family drama. And for me, that I didn't realize this until, like, several books in. But for me, that developed from the two books that had the biggest impact on me becoming a writer. And that was um, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen and Little Women by Louisa May Alcott are the two books that um, made me want to become a storyteller. I mean, I've always loved books and was a heavy reader and spent tons of time at the library as a kid with all my friends. So... But those two books were the ones that kind of made me want to become a writer. And so it wasn't until several books in that I realized that themes from those books in terms of kind of an unconventional heroine and, you know, the kind of family drama and stuff along with um, the love stories is kind of something that always ends up coming up in my books. And so once I realized that, then I just kind of embraced it. <laughs> and so and so now I, I, I kind of understand that that's part of my brand and what I like to read and therefore what I like to write. And so that's basically what kind of brought me to, to where I am in terms of what I, um, what I write, even though both of those were historical fiction. I still, you know, in contemporary, same thing. <laughs> Little Women was one of my favorite books. I think that's why I like big books. It's one of Little Women because I was a huge <laughs> book. <laughs> and I think it kind of, I never thought about it, but I think that um, um, pushes me through for family dramas that I like to write mm. of Little Women. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anissa, you have anything? Well, I guess I could say my journey in, into writing, you know, I would be, re I would say haphazardly. I ha I kind of fell into this to some degree. I've been involved in, in business, building a business myself, home-based business, for 20 years and within um, a direct sales company, but also independently doing contract work. And in the course of that time, about 10 years of that, I worked in a leadership, served in a leadership capacity where I mentored and coached other women on how to build successful businesses within my direct sales company. So much of what I share in the books that I write come from life experience of not only what I've done in business, but, you know, just, just working in various business-related industries. And as boring as that may sound to some people, I love it because this is like I'm wired for this. Entrepreneurship has been a part of my blood since I was about 14. I was always trying to find ways to make – use gifts and talents and things I made to create income. And so um, it's kind of, um, it's a part of, a part of who I am. So as a result of working in, well, I should say serving in a leadership capacity, helping other people, offering advice to other people, being a mentor to other people, 
in various business-related home base specifically, that's why this book came about. And so the idea to write the vendor blueprint was really the first was that was intended to be my first book, but in the course of starting the journey of writing, an opportunity came about. I was invited to be a part of an anthology um, that the book is called Ask for Me in My House, and that focused on entrepreneurship as well. And 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 saying yes to that opportunity, we I, we became a, the book hit um, Amazon bestseller and on an international status um, status. Mm-hmm. Um, international, um, um, Amazon bestseller internationally, basically. So because of that, it's just kind of like, oh, my God, does that mean that I'm considered an international bestseller yet? And my mentor was like, yes. So, so <laughs> the, first book didn't, the first book, which is the Vendor Blueprint, ended up being the second book because the, the anthology was published in December of last year, the day after Christmas. And then my book actually came out in February. So now that has propelled me into writing another book of my own that I'm writing, and then actually another anthology project that's due to come out in September. So when I say I haphazardly fell into becoming an author, I literally mean that. This is not something I ever imagined for myself. But it seems like as soon as I stepped, made the decision to step through the door to write a book, doors of opportunity just continue to open. And I'm, I'm grateful. I've been a reader, you know, so it's not like I'm foreign. It's, this is a foreign um, a foreign thing to me. It is foreign to me from the aspect that I never would have imagined being an author, had never written um, a book at all. And then um, in talking to my mentor, mentor, publishing mentor, and I said, but I've never written a book. She says, but you have written. And I'm like, well, when? Well, I used to write articles for a magazine. I never thought about that as being literary work. But anyway, I'm thankful for the journey. It has stretched me beyond my imagination. I began to learn a whole lot about the the literary world, and um, my mentor is excellent, and I'm still very much a novice in this genre of, of you know, author as being an author. I'm very much a novice, so to be even be able to be on this podcast, this podcast to talk about my books is just really kind of blowing my mind. So it's all very new to me. So for those of you who have been doing this for a while, my hat is off to you for sure. <laughs> Well, you don't seem like you're a newbie, so. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I will say well, thank that you. everybody has a book inside them. It's just a matter of being disciplined enough to get it out of you. <laughs> you know? I totally agree with that. You yeah. say, oh, I want to write a book, and I, as for me as an experienced person, I, I will say that it's, it's sitting down and finishing the book is probably the hardest thing for me, but... Um, I believe that we all have something that we can share to the world, you know, and it's just a matter of what is it that you want to share, you know, your fiction or your nonfiction. Um, I would like to know, how do you ladies uh, get book reviews? Wow, that's like the million-dollar question. <laughs> it's hard. It's been hard for me. That's probably of everything, every marketing aspect there is. It has been hard for me to get a lot of reviews. I don't spend as much time on it as I probably could and should, but really just asking as many people as you can. The problem is I think as I've seen people who I think want to help you and want to write a review, I found I believe more people are intimidated by the process when it's really – because we're writers – it would seem simple. I like the book because of A, B, C. It was good, period. You know, um, I don't think – I think people make it more complex than it has to be. And, you know, and some people really write really long reviews. Those are experienced people. And other people look at it like, is that a review? You want that? That's too much. And so I think it can be hard. But really asking people, I've tried to step up my ask um, this year for this last book. But it is still hard. People don't post, always post. Um, and, you know, you just have to, keep, you have to keep trying. I did participate um, last two years in NetGalley. Um, that is a, you know, a portal where you can request um, someone's book if you upload it on there. I was in a co-op, um, so there's about 10 of us, probably even 20 of us, that split the cost because it's very expensive. 
Um, and I was able to get a lot of um, nibbles that way and build a little small mailing list. I didn't participate in it this year, but I was able to get the names. And so that is definitely one way that people can get reviews. And I emailed them a separate letter, all of them. There might have been 45 people. And so, and that was so hard. I mean, less than 10, 15% of that uh, responded saying yes and still waiting for those, you know, reviews to get posted. So it's a very iffy, uncertain thing, venture that you have to have to deal with in order to get them. I would definitely agree with what you said about, you know, having to put that, first of all, it being hard, <laughs> and then having to put the effort in. Um, that's definitely one thing that I discovered a few years ago because I would, you know, look at how hard it would be to, you know, get, or to organically get reviews. Um, and then I started, like, talking to other authors and stuff, and the people who typically had a ton of reviews often would put more work into um, and to, to making it happen. And so that's when I started to step up my game <laughs> a little bit and, uh, you know, make it more of a process of it. So now, for instance, I do use Booksprout. Um, to manage my reviews, because um, at first I was, when I first started kind of stepping up and doing it more, I was just basically doing it inside my private Facebook group, which I still also um, manage reviews that way. Um, but now I use Booksprout to, to manage the process. And so um, you can do, I think, a free Booksprout account for like, it gives you like 20 um, reviews that you can put out there and, and people can pick them up and, and it helps to manage because as I think what Tracy was saying, a lot of times, you know, people will take the books or whatever and not leave a review. That's the nice thing about Booksprout is it kind of manages that process for you um, of reminding people about that, about the purpose of those particular books are being given as an advanced review copy as opposed to a free copy. I try to stress the difference in that because I do give away books for different reasons as well. But a arc or an advanced review copy is for the purpose of, you know, getting a review. So, um, but since I've started start putting more time and effort into that, <laughs> then I've definitely seen um, the number of reviews that I've gotten go up considerably. Um, and then just like recently, with these recent books, I used to just use the Booksprout free 20 account or whatever, and I update to the paid account. So I think this last time I put out quite a few more books and I definitely saw the results in terms of um, the reviews. And, and it's definitely helpful. I appreciate that question. I know. Listen, I've not even gotten to that point. I told you guys I am very new at this process. I've not even, I have not even ventured into um, that direction as of yet. And so thank you for the question because now I've been able to um, get the information I need from the other two people so I know what, I, what exactly I know exactly what to do. Um, one of the things I will say, however, is that in having my um, publishing mentor, one of the things she emphasized, and I know this is not technically the book review per se, but just prior to the, the launching of my book, I did solicit several beta readers to read the, the content mm -hmm. and to give me their honest feedback so that in, in printing the cover or in doing my own social media marketing campaigns of my books as they were coming out, I used the words of others to describe what they thought of my book as a result of them being my beta readers. Other than that, I've not done anything since the launching of the two books, but now that, as I said before, that I've been on this call, I know what now to do. <laughs> there you go. Well, we, we learn from each other. That's the, one of the right. reasons I do the podcast because I'm I'm always trying to learn something. And so you know, I ask authors to come on and they share their wisdom with me. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, I definitely um, the beta readers are your first reviewers. Really, they're they're going to tell you what they like and what they don't like, so you can you know improve your store your your book. So um, that's the first path that you're going to do when, you, when you're dealing with reviews. And I think the hardest part about reviews are the follow-ups. We send them out, and then we don't follow up. 
because that that was one of my biggest mistakes. I sent sent books out, but I was like, oh, they'll put the reviews when they read. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you you have to have a follow up a plan because people forget, or people they are you know they got other books they're reading too. I had one time I read this lady's book and she she showed me my follow up game was not on point because. I think once a week she sent me a message. Have you read the book? What did you think? <laughs> How is it? And I was like, well, let me finish this book because this lady. <laughs> but sometimes that's what you have to do, you know, to get that review. Yeah. Especially, and she was like, she had sent like 50 books out for reviews. And she was like, I'm on everybody. She said, I, I, it might mm. feel like it. She said, but that's my mission is to get those 50 reviews. And she got her 50 right. reviews because she had a great follow-up plan. So that's, I would mm-hmm. say that you're not bugging people. She wasn't bugging me. She just was putting it back in my head that, hey, you haven't wrote that review yet. What you do? And so right. that's, that's, if, you, if you take someone's book and you say you're going to do a review, then do a review. Don't, you mm-hmm. know, they shouldn't have to hound you down to do a review. But, again, people's mm-hmm. lives get busy. I understand that. But if you take it and, and you know, they've given you their hard-earned uh, book, with, you know, for free, you know, Please write a review. <laughs> it is it is hard to hard to find that balance because you don't want to come across as pushy. And if you send one too many emails, people will be like, "She is so pushy," and they you know they leave. You know, so but it's like it's, it's we're pushy, but you also didn't do what you said you was going to do. And so you know you have to find writers for the most part can be shy and and your and you know and your book is such a heart you know, birth thing that you have mm-hmm. that you don't mean. want to push forth it on somebody, but mm-hmm. at the same time, you're just like, why can't people just follow through? You know, <laughs> just do what you say. Right. You're do. It's hard. I, I did reviews for years with Sorbet, and people would contact me to say, oh, I want to be a reviewer. And so I would give them three follow-ups. If I didn't hear back from them, then I knew, okay, you don't get any more books. And at right. that time, I was right. mailing books off, so that was expensive. You mail a book to somebody, mm-hmm. and they're like, I got the book, mm-hmm. yeah, and you hear nothing right. else from them. And I realized, you know, three times is my limit. If I contact you three times and you haven't on it back, then you're telling me you're not going to respond, I'm done. But you guess what? You don't get any more books. <laughs> and right. so and that's, 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 that's for me thing. again why I find uh, books sprout to be so beneficial because of all the things you, you all just talked about. A, you know, the follow-up. It helps you follow-up because so it has, okay, it sends out, hey, the, the arcs are available. Hey, arc, hey the, this is the date the arcs are due. Hey, this is a reminder the arcs are due in, in like a week or two or whatever. And, and the, the second reason is what Tracy mentioned about us being, you know, writers kind of being shy and you don't really want to have to go out there and push, push, push people. And so it gives you that extra layer, you know, between you and sending them a direct email and being like, what's up? You know, so instead, right. instead you have, you know, this book sprout kind of does it on an automated, you know, um, schedule. And so, like I said, for me, even when I was just using the free one for with the 20, you know, if you don't have at least 20, that's great. You know, that, that's a start. So, but then eventually I, I did, you know, go up to the professional one. I think it's, um, I don't know, 10 or $20 per month. And you don't have to keep it all year, you know. So I figured out I'm, I'm going to keep it just the months that I need to have it. And then, but it, it is so helpful because, like I said, it manages that whole process of following up with people. And then it also, if you use it consistently, let's say somebody get, takes your books and they don't do the review, well, the next time when they come back and try to give another one of your books, they won't let them. It, it'll mark them as a person who did not fall mm-hmm. the last time, mm-hmm. which that was the, one of the harder things for me is have, I don't have time to go through and pay attention to who wrote a review and who did it, you know. And so that, to me, is worth it. That investment is worth it to be able to have it manage that and have it kind of be that buffer between me and standing over people being like, you know, you took this book. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's very helpful. I like that. I definitely will be putting that on my promotion list of things to do. Cause <laughs> I, I, I know from when I did my book that I, I sent out to uh, a lot of people, and I and um, I reached my goal for how many, but it wasn't the people I sent the book to. <laughs> so, mm, wow. you, know, so you, you have to be real, you know, and, and then they want to talk to you, and you know, you have my book. 
<laughs> you don't want to be like, I, I can't. you can't afford to talk. You ain't doing too long. <laughs> yep. So, how are you all doing since the quarantine has kind of shut down all the events, live events? So, what are you doing on social media to let people know you have a book? Wow. That for uh, just that whole thing about it crushing the event because I've, I've had two events that I was scheduled to attend that were canceled. Um, one was, can, you know, I had I had to cancel it. It was canceled anyway, but, like, I ended up canceling a couple of days before that because I was just like, okay, I just can't take the risk, you know, because that's when it was, we, were, we were really starting to find out about it, like, in March, um, you know, how devastating it was. And so it, it, it's hard. I mean, I do thank you. Thanks, thanks to you, LaShonda, because I was in your mastermind group, and you encouraged me to start a um, Facebook group. Mm-hmm. It's honestly the only reason why I did start a Facebook group. And so that Facebook group is very helpful. And, you know, having uh, readers who are familiar with me to be able to share stuff with them and um, all of that. So between that and then Twitter is probably where I get the um, most sharing and stuff of, you know, when I do promo. But it is hard. It's, it's, it's really hard. And, and also, like we were saying before, I don't know if things are ever going to be the same again anyway. So you really, I think we all need to really think about, even if, you, even if you're not saying we're never going to do live events again, you still need, I think we all need to think about having multiple ways to do this whether it's online or, or, you know, Zoom calls or whatever. I've, I've done, like, Zoom uh, discussions with readers, and I'm trying to do something uh, to also do more lives, like Facebook lives and, and Instagram lives and stuff, which terrifies me. But I'm trying to throw my big girl pants and do that. So. <laughs> I think that once you, once you get over the first one, then you see it's not a bad as you think it is, um, especially when you are in a room with people who want to be there with you. It's a whole different <laughs> ball game when you're there and you, it, nobody knows who you are and you're like trying to talk about your stuff when nobody knows you and they're like, get it over with, lady. But when you're in there with your readers, they're excited about their new book. They want to hear about the characters. They want to talk about the other characters that you wrote. It, it's a very pleasant experience. Most people that I know who, who go live, once they do the first one, they're like, oh, that, that wasn't the hardest part, I think, for me is you got to, you know, if you want to look really great, then you got to get your hair done and fix your face and all that stuff. But it's some people <laughs> that don't care. They put on a do-rag and keep it moving. So, you know, it's just how much you want to, how you want to oh, look when you go live. You know, mm-hmm. but I, I have... Uh, been so really proud of the people for this time frame that have stepped out of their comfort zone to try different things um, because they know that, you know, you can't sell books unless people know you have a book, you know, and mm-hmm. right now you're stuck in your own. Even, even me, I, I don't do too many events, but I had two great events I was invited to and they got canceled, you know, and I was like, oh, no. So, you know, I'm like mm-hmm. up in my game and I had I do two. I do a summit, and then I do the book festival. And I, I had already decided at the beginning of the year that I wasn't going to do the summit. That I was going to do the book festival, and that's in November. So I'm like, oh my God, I need to have something this summer. What am I going to do? You know. And uh, I came up with the book brag, and so that, that introduced people who were scared about going live. <laughs> But a lot of them came out and tried it for the first time, you know, and they're like, wait. And then they, they call me and they go, well, Shonda, I'm, I'm going live on my page. I'm like, well, great, you know. So mm-hmm. I, I think you have to, to in this time frame, you got to find, find the stuff that you like to do. And I say that, do that. If you're scared of going live, then don't do it because, believe me, it's going to come across. And you go look. Yeah, if anybody watched the, the the battles of Teddy Riley and, and Babyface, if you're not prepared, they will drag you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they will. They don't definitely you. will. They will, that's for sure. You don't want that your first sure. event being dragged. 
you know, and, and mm-hmm. it's, it's so easy to think, oh, I can just hit live and go live, but you you got to practice, mm-hmm. you got to be ready, <laughs> you know, and Teddy wasn't ready, he was trying to do a concert, dude, that wasn't what you were supposed to do. <laughs> <I know. laughs> he was too extra, too extra. Yeah, he went, he went overboard, but best that he wasn't prepared. <laughs> You know, so you have to be prepared for the different things. If you want to try a new platform, learn the platform before you go in there thinking you know what you're doing because you don't want to go live in front of people and not know. And, and you're like, oh, I don't know how to turn the sound up. Well, the sound supposed to already be up <laughs> before you get out there. You know, <laughs> you know, also you want to know if your Internet can handle that. So cause some people's Internet can't. You know, you don't want to go true. live and you go, hello, uh, your face broke, uh, I... Uh, uh, no. <laughs> That's something you should know before you go live, you know. Right. <laughs> That's correct. I have done personally some, some, um, well, some virtual events. I posted some virtual, I guess because I'm in the business, in the, in the, in the, in the business field or whatever. I, vendor events, you know, are, are non existent right now because we're social distancing. We're set, you know, we're quarantined in the house. So, um, I've hosted and participated in virtual events that that were, you know, dealt with business or either celebrating women in business or things that, that centered around women. And so um, for that reason, I could always, can, if I'm hosting, of course, I can always do my shameless plug of my books. And I even participated also in a, um, a virtual workshop hosted by Chosen Pen Publishing. She did an author's boot camp. And it was a small registration to pay, but it was a really good boot camp. It was about maybe four hours long on a Saturday, and um, it was done virtually. We had a, a uh, instructor and, you know, a little Q&A and interaction and everything, so that gave us an opportunity, not necessarily to promote your book per se, but actually connect with other like-minded people, those who are other authors with vari- from various cities and states or what have you. So that was a good thing. And you're you're right, um, Shonda, when it comes to <laughs> comes to going live, it will if you're not ready, it will show up and um <laughs> it's good to practice. And and really you know what I will say too is this. If you know that participating in the virtual community is where we're going where that's where we've gone. You 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 know, everybody's doing things virtually now. You know, businesses are doing virtual conferences and things of that nature. That's just the way of how business is being conducted and if you're not comfortable with that there are a lot of people that are hosting free workshops on how in teaching you how to do effective how to be effective in hosting your own live events. So I would encourage anybody, those that may be listening, especially if um if being in that if doing that or participating or hosting in that capacity makes you nervous, find a workshop and plug in while we have time at home then we can't go anywhere, to learn as much as you can and to feed yourself so that you are equipped with the tools you need to do things effectively. I think Teddy, Teddy Riley should have participated in a workshop before he, um, before he started <laughs> that battle because some of the things that he, he faced probably would have been alleviated if he had known in advance that someone said, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. And there are people offering free courses. I've been plugging mm-hmm. into them. So, Find a free course and plug in and learn as much as you can because the more we learn, that only strengthens us to be um, stronger in our um, in promoting ourselves as well as our books and our work. So anyway, so I've actually go been, out there and get it done. Uh, yeah, I've been uh, sad because so many events have been canceled. I mean, I'm able to work from home and everything for my regular job, but then the weekend, especially March, and this all happened in March, um, March is like my new year, and I actually put that on my Instagram, like Happy New Year, I usually put on March 1. I've done that for the last couple of years because that is when the winter isn't so harsh, and I feel like a loosening of, you know, my muscles and my brain, and I'm just kind of ready to go. And I usually from, you know, March, April till about November, the first, second week in November, it's still kind of warm in Virginia, and I usually do about two to three events a month, and I, then I go away and hibernate, hibernate like a bear, but... Um, so that was sad. I make a lot of my money um, to pay for my writing at live events because I think um, I just love people and I love being out, you know, with them. 
But my, um, like Anissa, my events have been able to transition some of them. You know, some of the planners are a little bit skeptical. I would also say that some of the planners have been a little bit older, and so they're very intimidated. They're like, I don't know about this Zoom thing. Let's just cancel it. Mm-hmm. Forget it. But um, some of them, you know, I've offered even to use my Zoom for them, and they've been receptive to that. I did a workshop um, for the James Rivers Writers. It's a, a, a group in Richmond area of Virginia. I live further in northern Virginia, closer to D.C., but they were willing to go online, and I was their first um, person to take the event online. They're doing a series of master classes. And I also went to a writer's retreat that was three days in um, in March, and uh, she was going to have it. I was so excited because it was going to be near my house. And I was like, I'm going to go, and it's going to be at the hotel, and it's going to be wonderful. But then she was like, we're going to cancel it. We're going to put it all online. And I actually had a really good time. I thought the transition to three days really online behind a computer, you know, the connection was still there. It was still great, and I had a great time. And there's actually two events. Um, that I'm a part of. I'm a support person for one of them. The National Christian Writers Conference is going online. It's usually held in Maryland, um, and it's going to be online this year, the second week in May. And then I also hosted, for the last four years, I've hosted my own writers conference, a very intimate writers conference. It's the first weekend of June. It's Friday night and Saturday all day, and that'll also be on Zoom. And so I think that... um, the people that have been able to adapt to this technology are coming out as winners. I actually secured a job just today just because I know Zoom and the person doesn't, and he hired me to really set all his sessions up for the conference um, just because I know what I'm doing and I know how to get the meeting link out to everybody and going to do a little Zoom um, information session on how to use it so all the speakers are on board. And so I was like, wow, that's a good, thank you, God. That's a wonderful blessing. So it's like cha-ching, cha-ching, you know. So, um, so, you know, the people that have been adapting are just doing so well, and then there's sadly there's still a digital divide about people who are not adapting and getting left in the dust. So it, it behooves you to, to learn this thing and get on board. Absolutely. Can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> I agree totally. And, and again mm-hmm. and again, because you know I'm virtual. I've been virtual for 20 years. I have been mm-hmm. me all the time. I know I I did the first online conferences. You know, right. I can go to live conferences, so I brought the conference to me. And that has always been my goal. If I can't go there, then bring it to me. And, uh, and when you're 12 are, steps ahead because of that. Counseling their conferences, and I'm going, you, you can bring it online. I've had three people. I've told them, I'll help you. Bring it online. Oh, I don't want to do online. It's not the same. You know, but if it's a money-making thing, you can bring it online, you know. So, mm-hmm. you know, but it, 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 it's time-consuming just as it is to plan one. Virtual is, is just as much time-consuming. Yes, it is. Uh, and you have to have a team. Most of the time, I do a lot of this stuff by myself. But when I teach people to do virtual events, I tell them to have a team because you don't want to be running around cuckoo with, it, with your head cut off like I normally do. <laughs> so mm-hmm. having a team really helps. And Anissa, you just um, inspired me for my um, my next training about going live. I'm going to be doing it in my in my social button. Just yes, go training. live. I, I've been thinking about what I want to teach for May, and May will be about going live because we have so many authors who are missing the boat because mm-hmm. they're, they they just don't want to jump on the virtual fence. But if you're getting a five dollar royalty check when you were used to a four or five hundred dollar one, something has to change, mm-hmm. you know. So you have that's to exactly right. Plus, right. you keep so much more of your money. I mean, I think that's one thing people don't really understand is that. You have zero overhead costs. You know, you can break for lunch and tell people, go on in there and get your own food, eat that, whatever you got, <laughs> and come on back at 1 o'clock and we'll resume. You know, and so you just, you just cut down years. so many costs. Yeah, and, so, and, and people tell me all the time, when are you going to do a live one? And I said, my niche is online. I said, my niche is online because there's so many of us who can't leave our homes or who can't afford to go to a conference, or who can't mm-hmm. leave their kids. That was me when I started. I had two toddlers, and I couldn't go anywhere. 
And so I was like, I'm going to bring it to me. And that's, and mm. virtual, virtual is just another option. You don't have to stay. It is. It, but right now you're stuck in the house. You can't do anything. And I have, I, I, like I said, I've had an amazing time <laughs> during this quarantine. I've been to concerts. Mm-hmm. I've learned tr- different things that I wanted to learn that I wouldn't sit down. I started, I I invested in my T-shirt business, so I got the cricket and the press. I'm going to get down with them because, you know, it pushed me out of my comfort zone too. Okay, I need to make some money. How am I going to do that? <laughs> so, you know what, LaShonda, one other thing. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you okay, off. That's fine. a delay, I think. What mm-hmm. I was going to say, one other thing is that what we fail to realize is that when you choose to do go virtual, you open up your doors to an audience that you would not have had an opportunity to meet otherwise. Exactly. Just this conversation in and of itself. I live in North Carolina, and I hosted an event on Monday. And I'm hosting an event, and I had two other ladies to co-host, as you said before, get people to help you. And it was, it was a small, intimate setting. It was maybe 25, 27 women, but we had five states represented. No, six states mm-hmm. represented. You know, right. and the anthology project that I'm spearheading, uh, I got 15 women that's participating in this anthology, and we had a conference, like a mini workshop. And we have, um, when I put it out there virtually, you know, on the world, you know, on, on social media, and people began to respond, I've got five states and the Virgin Island represented. I've never been to Oregon, but I've got a woman that lives in Oregon that's going to be a part of this anthology project. So, you know, her op- her um, her community, her sphere of influence is an extension of me now because we're doing this project together. And I think we miss out, I don't think I know, when we don't choose to embrace the virtual community, we, we don't open up the op- – we, we limit ourselves as to our exposure because there are people out there that would – plug into what you offer virtually because, as you said, they can't get out. They don't know you. Something about you may be attractive to them, you know, attractive to them. And then who's to say that they're plugging in to your event won't open up a door in another city, another state, another continent that you never would have imagined only simply because you made a decision to step outside your comfort zone. That, that is so true. And also – there have been people, um, the retreat that I went to last month, there were some people there from Japan and Korea. I mean, you really can't go international as far as your mm-hmm. participation. Yeah, I, my, all events that I do are international. I have friends in Korea, Japan, Paris, Sweden, you know, and so it's, it's all over the world. And when, when people tell me, oh, it's not, it's not a much, lot of networking when you're doing virtual, and I'm like, have you ever been to a virtual event? With the networking that you do, the uh, events that I've hosted have opened up doors for me with other people because they're like, oh, uh, I know you talk social media. Can you come to social media here? Can you come talk? Uh, somebody invited me to come talk about grief. I would have never thought. But they were like, I heard you talk about grief online. I want you to come and talk about that in my thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got canceled, but, you know. <laughs> but that opened up a different market for me because I never thought about talking about grief to somebody mm-hmm. else, but, you know, somebody needed so. All right, ladies, this has been fun. I've enjoyed it. Um, Me too. I want to thank you for sharing with us today. Please let the listeners know how they can contact you online. This is Tracy Lydia Garner. You can visit my website at tracygarner.com and follow me on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, at Trace at T Garner, T E E G A R N E R. And this is Reese Ryan. You can find me online at Reese R E E S as in Sam E Ryan R Y A N dot com. And from there, you can join my private Facebook group where we have fun and, and do you know behind the scenes excerpts and stuff like that um, and other things. So. But, yes, yeah, that's the hub right there, reachrand.com. And this is Anissa Short. I can be found on Facebook under my um, business name, which is the Work From Home CEO. You can find that by doing ampersand W-F-H-C-E-O. I'm also on Instagram using that same um, ampersand contact. Um, I am also 
the work um, the work from home CEO dot biz online. All right. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to write a review on the platform you are listening to, or send a review to me at onesoremag at gmail dot com. I love hearing from our listeners. It's always it always makes my day. Would you like to be a guest on Sore Mag's Writers Cafe? Send me an email, teach me, and let me know what you want to talk about at onesoremag at gmail dot com. I would like to thank our sponsor for this episode, Virtual Tea with Lashonda promotion strategy sessions. Check the link in the show notes to schedule your virtual tea with LaShonda. Would you like to be a sponsor of an episode of SoreMag Writers Cafe? Send an email to onesoremag at gmail.com. Social Butterfly. If you haven't taken time to promote your book or services today, go showcase those wings. Someone needs what you have. This is LaShonda Hoffman, and I will see you on the next. Are we on?